Hey there, fellow streakers. What a wonderful, beautiful day, especially because we have an awesome guest joining us on the Streaking Podcast today. Our guest grew up in Washington, D.C. He and his brother were raised by a single father who taught them the importance of ambition, drive, and hard work. He played NCAA Division I football for Howard University, then was drafted into the NFL where he played for the Titans, Bills, Ravens, and Jaguars. After his NFL career, he started a construction business that grew into one of the largest minority subcontracting businesses in the city of Baltimore. After making a bad mistake, he had to file Chapter 7 bankruptcy. Down and out, not knowing what to do next, he had a pivotal moment where he decided to accept what had happened, take charge of his life, and move forward. Today, he is a persuasive author, an inspirational speaker, a sought-after consultant, and a fantastic coach to major corporations all over the world. Jamie, let's welcome to the show Marcus Ogden, and let's get streaking. Marcus, we are so thrilled to have you today and be able to talk to you for a little bit. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. This has been so much fun to learn more about you, and I'm so excited to talk to you about your story and what you do and how we can incorporate what we do with streaking with what you seem to do naturally. But I wanted to start off today by asking a little bit more of a personal question as we, um, as I've listened to some things that you've done in the past, I've been super inspired and fascinated about you growing up in a single parent home with a father and the relationship that you seemed to have with your father. You talk about him very kindly and I can only imagine the amount of effort and work that goes into raising boys that become professional football players and the sacrifices that he must have made to make that all happen. So I wanted to just ask you a little bit about your relationship with your father and how what he did to help make that grow so that you guys were able to have such a great relationship. That's a great question, Jamie. Our father was our best friend. He was our North Star. He was our guiding light. But at the same time, he was a disciplinarian. You didn't want to cross him. I mean, at his heaviest, he was probably about, he was six foot four and his Heavy is about 450 pounds. Oh, wow. wow. So, I mean, you're talking about a very large man, very, very intimidating. And if you crossed him, it would probably be the last time you ever did. Yeah. <laughs> Having a father like that, but that's what we needed because my brother was 6'9 in the eighth grade. Wow. wow. I grew to be, I'm almost six foot six, six five and a half, six six. So you need to have someone like that to kind of help get their, the children, especially young boys, young men, mm -hmm. going in the right direction. And it's interesting, I just got a picture from my, um, it's from my, uh, from my, my cousin. I'll, I'll send this to put this up really quickly. You really can't see a whole lot, but this is a picture of my family. So this, this is my grandfather, my, wow. mother, my, my grandmother, my father, my uncle, both my uncles. And looking at this, it reminded me of how his dad raised him. So my grandparents were together, but my grandfather was 6'4", 260, 270, truck driver, big man. And he had to raise three boys. They had five boys, two passed away early, one at childbirth, one was two years old. But my dad and my uncles were raised by a very strong father figure in my grandfather and a great grandma and mother figure in my grandmother. But it's kind of like he passed down from my grandfather to my father, my father to us. So having that father figure was absolutely imperative, in my opinion, in my brother and I turning out the way we the way we are today. I would agree. And something I've just as as Father's Day was approaching, I just was so inspired as you talked about being raised in a single parent home because so often there is a little bit of an assumption when people say single parent that most of the time you think they were raised by their mom so i loved that you talked so much about your father and having i have seven children but i it wasn't until the last two that i had a boy and a boy right next to each other Mm. And two boys next to each other act very differently than when they have sisters in between them. And mm. so I very much can appreciate that it would take some discipline and some a lot of training to be able to raise a boys, a you know, strong boys that have a lot of 
I'm sure you guys had a lot of energy. And so. Oh, oh yeah, for sure. We were very rambunctious running around. So <laughs> yes. it, it definitely needed that strong father figure to kind of keep us going in the right direction. In the right direction. When was, when did you, so when did you get on the football path? Was that early in life? And did your father put you on that? And I, Talk Great to us a little question. bit about that. So yeah. I didn't play football until my freshman year of high school. We were, oh, too, wow. we were too big to play Pop Warner, any of that stuff. And our father was never the one to push us in that direction. He said, if you want to play, play. I'll support you. I'll love you. If you don't want to play, I'll support you. I'll love you. But my brother started playing in the seventh grade at his high school, well, his middle school and high school, St. Albans. And of course, me wanting to be like my brother, then I fell into football in, in high school. We didn't have football in seventh, eighth grade at my high school, only basketball. So I started playing football as a freshman in high school. And to be honest with you all, I really wasn't that good in high school, not to probably my last year, because I didn't really hit a growth spurt until after I left high school. I really didn't have a lot of great coaching in high school. I mean, it wasn't bad, but it wasn't like my brother who had exceptional coaching through seventh, eighth grade, all through high school to make him a really great player combined with his natural size and ability and all that kind of stuff. So that's really where we started playing football. He was seventh grade and I was ninth grade. So when you started to take football seriously, was was it th w when you s basically hit your senior year? Is that when you thought, you know what, this is this is something I want to pursue into the NCAA one division football, or was it before that? And what were some of the consistent actions that you started to do when you got serious about it? Well, not really, because I played hard and I actually thought that my career was going to be over after high school because I got no scholarship offers until the very end from Howard University. I had one scholarship offer. Wow. It. That's it. So I didn't even think about playing football seriously for a career until my after my junior year of college. Wow. So wow. I literally was going to college to be an investment banker, work on Wall Street. You know, I interned at Merrill Lynch uh, my sophomore year, downtown K Street, Washington, D.C., probably about three or four blocks from the White House. And that's what I wanted to do. I was focused on just going to school. Say, if I become a starter for a year or two, that's awesome. And I'll be happy with that and move on with my life. But I became a starter as a freshman on at Howard at right tackle. Then I played right tackle my first year, my second year, moved to left tackle my third year. And then after that, that's when I started seeing my name on draft boards and football books and all that kind of stuff. Then I took it completely seriously with my workouts. And I tell people this, if your habits do not align with what you want to achieve, your habits will always win. And mm -hmm. that's when I said, if I'm going to do this, I have to have my habits aligned with what I wanted to achieve with being an NFL athlete. So thank God Howard got a strength coach my last year. We're still friends to this day. I've worked hard on the football field, in the weight room, in the classroom. I didn't really mess around a whole lot with partnering or anything like that, you know, my last year. I took complete focus. I went to an all-star game in the Hula Bowl in Maui, did well against guys from Florida State, Texas, Rice, Alabama, Miami. Because back when I played in college, the big school was Miami. Like mm -hmm. that was the big powerhouse. And so, you know, and you know, and also so was Texas. Texas and, and, and my coach for that team actually was Mac Brown who was at Texas at the time, and he's now at Chapel Hill as the football coach at UNC Chapel Hill. So it's actually seen Washington go full circle. But for me, it was after my junior year of college that I said, hmm, maybe I could make this a career in the NFL. Let's go for it. Yeah. Wow. Fantastic. And so when you got drafted into the NFL and started down that career path, that was something that you had not seen till your senior year of college. And so at, in the NFL, what were some of the life lessons that you carry with you today that you learned through the NFL? That's one I have. Everybody, I, I had some great ones, right, uh, Jeff? But the best one, and I use it in all my keynotes, Jack Dario told us that he was the head coach of the Jacksonville Jaguars. Jack said, gentlemen, 
you talk to all of us drafted players, drafted rookies and undrafted rookies. He said, gentlemen, I'm a rookie like you are as a coach, okay? You all are rookies with the Jaguars. Here's what I'm gonna tell you. If you want to succeed in life, you have to be your own CEO. You have to be your own chief executive officer. Can I tell you what time to get here for breakfast to start the day? Absolutely, I can. Can I tell you what time practice is over? You can go home? Absolutely, I can. Can I tell you what time to get to work early to work on your craft? Absolutely not. Can I tell you what time to stay after practice and work on your craft late at night to get better? Absolutely not. Can I tell you to go out into the Jacksonville community and build relationships with the Jaguar fans to help improve our fan base? Absolutely not. You can. So you have to understand, you work for the Jaguars, but you are your own CEO. If you want to be the best in football and in life, if you approach it like that, that will get you greatness. Best thing I ever heard in my career, and I heard a lot in my career. Brian right. Billick was awesome. Mike Malarkey, Dick Chiron, Jeff Fisher. I've met Steve Bashotti. I mean, uh, all these guys are phenomenal. But Jack's words, when I was a 22-year-old rookie, scared to death, I'm like, wow, I'm an NFL player, and I got to go out and perform, and I was very, very nervous. Those words have stuck with me, and they will stick with me, Jeff and Jimmy, to the day I die. Oh, yeah. And those those words right there, as uh, you know, we listen to what you're saying with being your own CEO. In other words, take control of your life, make it intentional. And you decide what paths you want to and th- what paths you want to travel, and that aligns directly with what you said before: is align and what we call here your streaks with who you want to be. So you're streaking on a on a regular basis, daily, weekly, monthly, to align with who you want to be, and being in charge of your being your own CEO really helps that along. So now. Now that fast forwards us just a little bit. I mean, you had a, 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 the career in the NFL, but then you you out of the NFL, you started your um, company, and it was a construction company, and you had some awesome success, but then some really tough lessons. You got that right. I built Caden Premier Enterprises, and we became the largest African-American-owned subcontracting company in the city of Baltimore and the state of Maryland in the, in the area of, or the scope of site work, concrete, utilities, demolition. That had it, to feel good, I mean, to build it that big. It was awesome. And we were yeah. an eight-figure business. Wow. But unfortunately, my ego got in the way. As we started to make money, my ego went through the roof. I became very self-centered. I became very arrogant. I became very focused on what I wanted and what I thought was important. And nothing, nothing else. I call those external motivating factors, money, fame, notoriety, things that mean nothing. And because of that, that ego cost me my best employees. They left. That started to break the foundational cracks. When I took a job for a construction company client and I spent about $3 million in 90 days, between 2.5 and $3 million in 90 days to do what was necessary for what I thought was change order work for the client. When they denied my change order, it sent me into a chapter seven complete bankruptcy. Wow. Home foreclosed on, both cars repossessed in the same day, lost all of my money. When I moved to Raleigh, I had $400 to my name. This is why one of our main signature keynotes is titled The Ego Mistake from eight figures to 825 per hour. Wow. (laughs) That is an ego mistake, wow. That is an amazing that just so as you as you looked back at what point in this process were you able to look back and say okay this was an ego problem like like because you talk a lot about taking accountability being the CEO at what point in this process were you able to say 
yeah, I got a problem and I got it. It's my problem. I got to fix it. You know what it was? When I was working as a custodian on the graveyard shift, that's when it happened. Between um, April 2013 and uh, September 2013, before that happened, I still was in an ego mindset. I was victimized. Poor Marcus, his partner, the client, boo hoo, all Marcus has done is nothing. He's been taken advantage of. And God said to me, okay, Marcus, that's how you feel. Let's try this. So I was working. I came down here to Raleigh. I worked at Merrill Lynch for a short time. I got fired after, what was that? Two months, all my fault. Went to a construction company the next day fired five days later. So I was fired two times in the same week. Wow. I ended up starting a small football business, training kids. I was a birthday clown uh, at parties for kids in a seven on seven camp just to make ends meet. When my kids started to come less because they were in football, I needed to make more money. I took a job as a custodian. One of my clients had a custodial business and I worked for her for 8.25 per hour from 10 p.m. till 5 a.m. on the graveyard shift. I was throwing the trash out in the trash dump like I always did on my shift. And I ended up throwing it into the trash and I missed the trash because all that trash came right back on my body. There was a rip on the front side of the bag that I couldn't see. All that nasty protruding rotten meat spoiled milk, nasty, protruding, horrible smelling garbage Mm. all over my body, my skin, and my clothes. And that was my wake up call. I sat down on the curb, put my head in my hands and I cried for 10 minutes. And I said, right then and there, there's no accountability in my life, no responsibility in my life. And your ego got the best of you and put you right here on this curb. That's when I said, all right, Marcus, get up, go home, write down your three biggest strengths, figure out what you do well. I said, I like to communicate, I like to speak, I wanna help people. Let's start keynote speaking. Tony Robbins was a custodian at some point in his life, how hard can it be? Look where he is today. I started speaking all for the wrong reasons. My benefit, trying to make money, trying to do this, trying to be famous, got nowhere fast didn't get a paid job for two and a half years. Mm. Got our first paid job, April 2016 for Miller Mock College. After that, got humbled, got coached, learned how to develop myself, how to better myself. And our brand in the last six years has worked for 38 Fortune 500 clients as a speaker. Wow. 15 are Fortune 100, six are Fortune 25. We are a three-time best-selling author. We are a podcast host. We are a business coach. We are a consultant. And we are a brand ambassador working with different organizations. And we're working on online products and services to be able to help people that can't afford our high-ticket items. Yeah. And again, like I tell everybody, don't get caught up in the day-to-day minutia and grind of what you have to do. That's why so many people, about 95 to 99% of society falls off because they get so caught up in, well, I I can't be famous today. I can't make money today. And today's not going to go well for me. So I might as well throw the towel. I've been doing this for a week, for a month, for a year. I'm not there yet. I'm going to throw the towel in. Well, that's not the way it is. It takes time to build something of global appeal. If I would have took that approach, I would have never, ever kept going after being told no on every paid job for two and a half years. I tell my clients, I want to tell your audience, focus on the end result you want. Don't focus on the difficulty of the day-to-day actions to get to where you want. Because if you do that, you're going to get discouraged, you're going to get upset, you're going to get very disliked, you'll be very frustrated. What's going to happen? You're going to quit. You're going to give up. That's what, did, what happens. What did you do to get past, like to get yourself to keep doing those daily things that you needed to do, the minutiae of it? Because those are the things that are going to create that output that you're talking about, but also the things that we sometimes look at and think, 
It's not making a difference right now. So why am I keep doing this? How did you get yourself to keep doing those things? I realizing it now, I didn't realize it then. I just finished reading a great book called The Breakthrough Code. And what I did was I upgraded my story to upgrade my life and I created my breakthrough story and I stuck to it. People said, Marcus, you're never going to be a successful speaker. You're not Tony Robbins. You're not white, you know, 5'11", six foot with blonde hair, blue eyes. You're not going to relate to people. Well, no, I'm not Tony Robbins. No, I'm not white. Yes, I kind of figured that out. I'm good. <laughs> Thank you for, <laughs> thanks for helping me out there. <laughs> Tell me the obvious. But I know I have a story to tell. And I got told no so many times. I was beat up mentally so many times. People that I knew for years tell me that I'll never be successful. Don't do this. Go coach high school football. Stay in your lane. You're in Ogden. Go coach at college in a small town in North Carolina. Get free Waffle House. Get free insurance. Get all this for your life. And just live your life and be okay with being miserable and being average. And I never did. I never, ever gave up on the breakthrough story that I created for myself. And that's because visualization is a powerful, powerful tool. So if let me you ask you about that for just a second. Yeah. So as you talk about visualization and some of the things you do, what are some of the daily things that you do to keep to have visualization? What is like your morning routines and some of the daily things that you do to make that happen? I wake up every morning. I help my wife get my daughter off of school. I make my bed. I, I want to achieve that. So when I come home, my bed is made. I feel accomplished. I go to the gym. I meditate. I do my lift, run, car, whatever the case may be. Get home, take care of the dogs, make sure they're good. Then I start my day. But I live by my calendar. I just saw, this is current news, I just saw yesterday. Uh, so today is the, uh, what's the day? The first, or the second. So I saw yesterday, June 1st, Marion Barber the third passed away. He was former Dallas Cowboys running back in his in his apartment. They don't know what happened, but people are saying, and it's possible it was CTE related. Mm -hmm. People that I know, like Des Bryant, other great athletes, are saying that Marion was having a really hard time adjusting to not having football in his life. And he would see things of himself when he was playing. He, mm -hmm. you know, he he had a hard time moving on, which I feel because I've been there. Right. And so my point is, is that for me, I live by my schedule, you know, and I've learned how to be efficient with my time. Right. And again, when I finish here, I have a call right after this. I have to get on a team meeting at 12. I have to do have to shoot another podcast at one. Like my schedule is pop, 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 pop. And I remember when I first got to Carolina, I was struggling in business. My day was just like wide open. There was no structure. Oh, let's go ahead and watch Match Game 77 on the Game Show Network. Let's watch Cash Cab. Let's let's watch The Price is Right and see the old Bob Barker who hasn't been around since the 80s. And then let's just watch him. Why not with nothing else to do? Because I didn't have a schedule, right? So to keep myself focused, I am very much active with taking care of things in the house. I'm very clean. I take care of my body. I go to the gym. I try to watch what I eat sometimes. I'm, you know, I still like to have whatever, but I, I'm very <laughs> mindful of that. But also my schedule is pop, pop, pop. If I don't have a schedule to live by, then I feel I'm not going to get the best things done in a day. Do you do your schedule on a, uh, so like, do you do it Sunday and then you do it for the week or how, how do you do it's that? Really, it's always like a week ahead because I have coaching calls, sales mm -hmm. calls. I sometimes book things out a couple weeks in, in advance. Mm -hmm. I always review my schedule for the upcoming week on Sunday. <clears throat> Just don't have any surprises. If I have any open gaps, if I can fill them with things to do work, -wise, work related, great. If not, I have a little bit of free time, which is very rare. And even like yesterday, I was watching uh, Death Wish 1, the very first Death Wish 1, like for like 20 minutes here, I had a call. Then 20 minutes there, I had a call, right? You know, but again, like, you know, I, I, I'm, very, I'm a very authentic kind of guy. I don't, I don't BS people. Right? I mean, that's just what I do. Because again, right. I work hard. You know, I, I, I have a phenomenal team around. It takes care of a lot of things. So I don't have to be in the business. I work on the business. So if I had a little free time, oh, sure, take the dogs for a walk. But yesterday, I said, Hmm. Let's watch Death Wish. My grandfather will be proud of me. Let's watch a little bit of that. That's what I did. You know what I mean? I'll got to finish it later today if I have time. But 
that's only if I have time. Because if it's in my schedule, it's getting done. Yeah. So in our final minutes, do you have one more question? No, just the things that I've noticed as we've been talking about this that have been so in line with what I feel like we talk a lot about with streaking is one, this this idea of taking accountability and responsibility. I love that you were in this place where life was beating you up and you, because you looked at it and said, I can take accountability for this and all that comes with that, all the mistakes, all of the choices, that was hard, but it it entitled this or it, it enabled this ability to be free because now you also had the ability to change that, to make decisions and to be able to change your circumstances and your situations. And then the second thing that I've taken away from what we've talked about is this intentionality that you talk about when I am doing things with intentionality, that's when I'm being successful. When I am just letting things go and not creating a schedule, not deciding what I want to do with the day, just letting it happen, there's no intentionality to it. And you're like, I, I wasn't successful. I wasn't doing what I wanted to do. I wasn't being who I want to be. And so that's so in line with what we talk about with streaking is this take accountability for the person that you want to be and be intentional. Recognize that doing something for enough days in a row doesn't mean that it's going to be automatic and you won't have to think about it. You are going to have to still make those decisions and be intentional. Yeah. So in the final moments, Marcus, give what, you know, if someone's in that place where they were down and out and need to pick themselves up and start going, give us what your advice would be to them. And then just let us know where our listeners can look for you and also look for any speaking engagement if they want to bring you on as a speaker. Two things. Great quote by Aristotle. In times of extreme darkness, focus on the light. If you're in a dark place, focus on the light, which I believe Aristotle meant. This is what I believe. Focus on what you do well society programs us to say you don't do this well you don't do that well yeah i get it thank you very much i'll try to work on that but when you know what you do well it inspires you it energizes you it fuels you for greatness if i didn't focus on what i was good at when i started speaking and the why behind speaking i would have fell off the wagon so I'm gonna tell people, create your breakthrough result that you desire, align that breakthrough result with your purpose, AKA your why, and understand that your subconscious, AKA your superconscious, or AKA your superpower can drive you anywhere you want to in life. But you have to feed it positive visualization, positive images, the subconscious does not work well off of words. It needs visualization, it needs meditation, it needs quiet interaction, it needs to focus and connect the brain to what with what you want. So what I would tell people is align your breakthrough result that you desire with that purpose. So create that breakthrough result, align it with what you want and why you're doing it, upgrade your story, create your story, and no matter what, never ever give up on your story. Never quit on your desired results. If you want to find us, you can go to our website, www.marcusmarquesogden.com. You can connect with us or shoot me an email, marcus at marcusogden.com. We'd love to connect with you, get in touch with you, and uh, have a conversation. Fantastic. Marcus, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much for joining us today. We know you've got that schedule to keep, and we appreciate it. And we appreciate all that you've given us. And most importantly, I'm grateful, and Jamie's grateful, that you decided to become someone who could teach us and everyone how to be intentional about life. So thank you very much. Streakers. If you want to get a hold of Marcus, do. He's a phenomenal speaker, and you can go out and buy his book as well. His book is at Amazon and other places. It's called The Success Cycle. He also has a great podcast that I've subscribed to and listened to. He get, interviews some great people. So go out there and find him. Marcus, thank you for joining us today. Everyone else, keep streaking. 
Well, Jamie, that was a dynamic conversation with Marcus. Yes, it was. Very enthusiastic, passionate individual. With a ton of actual experience in a multitude of different arenas. Yeah, completely. What were some of the things that you looked at? I mean, he brought up so many great overarching themes that could apply to streaks. Mm -hmm. What were some of the ones that you that you took away? I was thinking of different streaks that you could set in relation to the things that he mentioned that he does. So he talked about meditation and I thought that is something that that's would a be streak that's right a streak there. right there to meditate. He talked and One of the things let me just go let me go on that for just a second because when we talk about meditation one of the things that can happen very quickly is to say, well, I'm going to meditate for a certain amount of time mm -hmm. every day. And I always discourage that because then I'm always looking at the clock and I'm not really focused on the meditation. Whereas what I would recommend is to make the streak, I'm going to meditate for at least X breaths. Mm, that's so in other idea. words, it could be five or 10 or 12 or 15. You could do it that way so that then you're focusing on the right places, which is your breathing and what you've got going on. You could, if you don't want to count your breaths, just say, I'm going to meditate at least one time daily. Mm -hmm. And that then gives you the opportunity to be very long with your meditation or very short with your meditation. And we, a lot of the people that we've talked to have said this is one of the areas where every day they need to do this. And this is a great streak I to agree. have. And I, I appreciate what you said in the sense of letting go of the time. When you first said that, I thought, well, that's part of meditation is to help you to let go of those outside things and not set timers around them. Um, and so would setting a time be like, okay, I need to focus on this so that I get past this part. But as you were talking, I thought the beautiful thing about focusing on your breaths is again this first of all a streak is an at least so that you're taking into account all of the days in your life and what they're going to look like so we're not talking about your perfect meditation day we're talking about every single day and as i thought about that i thought again it just brings that level of intentionality to your life mm -hmm. so if your streak is to meditate for a certain number of breaths you can do that almost anywhere yeah the dependencies and at are any very time, low. The dependencies are very All low. All you need is oxygen. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and so I look at it and think that allows for you to be have this place of intentionality where what is meditation? It's helping you be more mindful, mindful of your circumstances, mindful of how you're responding to those circumstances or reacting to them, mindful of taking control of the person that you want to be not being controlled by the circumstances those are all things that when you're intentional and meditating you can do that in different situations right and so if it's meditate for a certain number of breaths you may have a routine to meditate at a certain time because that works but if that routine falls out of place the streak helps you be able to meditate in all situations and circumstances. The new word we came up with, the streak is immune, is immune to, routine. to routine and to the circumstances that mm -hmm. are around there. Yeah. The other thing that I love that he said, focus on your breakthrough result or upgrade your story. To me, and then he also talked about vis visualization. To me, all of those things are looking at who you want to be. And there are actual, I haven't ever thought about this before, but could I set a streak around the visualization of who I want to be? I think so. I think you could have a streak on a, a weekly streak mm -hmm. because it fits right in line with meditation, but yes. you could look at it and say, I'm going to med I'm going to visualize at least one time weekly what my breakthrough story is or what it looks like. Yes. And I could do that so I have always thinking what I want to be. It's it's like, for example, the streak that I have, and I think you have it as well, is I write my B statement at least one time or one sentence of my B statement at least one time daily. And that helps me to continue to focus on who I want to be, just like what it is that Marcus said. And he said. said something interesting. He said the word does or the, the mind doesn't always listen to the words. You need visualization. Mm -hmm. And so exactly what you said, I thought I write my B statement every day. But what power could I add to it if I was to visualize who I want to be, if that became a part of my streak? And I was thinking of these streak stacks where I'm like, I write by me, B state. 
development. I, I visualize who I want to be. Right. Uh, funny story about visualization. We had a point where we were going to move to Indiana and we had put money down on a house and I had gone to that house and then something happened before we were able to move and we ended up not moving to that house. But I have vivid memories of living in that house. Because you had visualized because yourself I had there. I visualized raising my kids there and them going out in the backyard and there was no fences and I was excited about that and it had this little secret passageway room and I was excited about that. And I visualized raising my kids in that room and I look back and I'm like, I feel like I have real life memories of that house even though we've never lived there. Mm -hmm. So the power of visualization is a real thing and setting a streak around that, mm -hmm. I can see some massive power there. There was one thing that he mentioned early on that I wanted to come back to and that was he said about aligning your habits mm -hmm. with your life and that if you didn't do that, then what would happen is the automatic things that you do would take over and that's who you would become. I wanted to highlight that for just a second because this is where we really get into the difference between a habit and a streak. Mm -hmm. A habit, when someone says, I want to develop a habit, they're talking about, I want this to be automatic. Now what Marcus was saying and completely agree with, if I put my life on autopilot, on automatic, yes. it will go wherever those behaviors that are automatic take me. Right. Whereas if I change that and say, I'm going to go on intentional, I'm not going to be on autopilot. I'm not going to let this plane fly itself. I'm going to take control and fly it. That's where streaks come in. Right. Because streaks now are intentional activities, laughably simple things that I'm going to do consecutively every single day. So for example, some of the things that he talked about were actually streaks. I go to the gym mm -hmm. every day. That's not automatic. No. I take my daughter to school or my wife to work, daughter to school. Again, not automatic, intentional. I meditate. Mm -hmm. That is a streak. I'm looking at it and I'm saying, I'm making sure that I'm doing these things. That was his adherence to schedule mm -hmm. is, is indicative of adherence to your streaks. I am who I, or I am what I do every day. And I am what I do repeatedly. And that's yeah. what, when we talk about habits, those are the two big definitions is the one, the things that are going to be automatic. But oftentimes people are talking about the things that you do repeatedly. And and to me, that's what I heard when he said, um, if your habits don't align with what you want to achieve, your habits are always going to win. If you take the word habits and say, if the things that you're doing repeatedly don't align with what you want to achieve, the things that you do repeatedly are going to win. Yeah. And here's my little bit of allergic reaction because I don't agree that people mean repeatedly when they talk about habits. I think that that's... I think they mean automatic. That it's going to come automatic. That it's going to be mm -hmm. automatic. I don't think that they say it's going to be something I'm going to do consecutively all the time. I mean, anyone who you talk to, ask the question, how many days does it take to make a habit? What are you really asking? How many days does it take to make it automatic. Mm -hmm. That's really what's being asked there. Even though I know that in a lot of the literature that's out there, it's what I do repeatedly. If I'm not doing that consciously and it's not going to become automatic, it's not going to become something that I just do without thinking. And the thing that I look at the power of streaking is the things that I do automatically do create who I am. Yeah. And that's what streaking does for me is it makes it so that I am intentionally choosing every day the things that I'm going to do repeatedly. You're not repeatedly. leaving it to automatic. You're not leaving it to automatic. I yeah. am. And that was my big takeaway from talking with Marcus. The two things that I really, really resonated with me was his ability and and this passion for take accountability. That I think that was a hard one lesson for him. Yeah. Where he reached this point where he's like, I am where I am because of my own choices. It takes a lot it's to say huge. my ego got me where I yes. am right now, which is having a bag of Sitting trash. Sitting on the side of the just curb soaked, soaked in, in other milk. people's trash. Yeah. yeah. After having been a professional football player. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty big that's a pretty big fall. Yeah. to go from one place to another. And so, and then the other thing that I just, my takeaway was his intentionality. He talked 
all the time about intentionality. He used different words, but in everything, he was like, you need to decide this is who you, you want to be. be this is you, you be your own CEO that is making your own decisions. I loved his uh, final quote there, Aristotle's quote, which mm-hmm. was, when in dark places, focus on the light. And he interpreted it as that on focus on what you do well. That could be another streak. That could totally be another streak. In fact, that was another one that I thought I could benefit from that. The, the idea of writing down the things that I do well and and reminding myself of them every day. You yeah. do this well. Because we don't have to worry about being reminded of the things we don't do well. So what That's would that streak take look care like? Of itself. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. What what would that streak look I like would, for you? I, if I were to set that streak, I would say at least once a day, pick at least one thing that I'm good at. Wow. Say That'd one really thing cool. that I'm good at to myself. Yeah. And just and just remind and maybe it's a list. Maybe I write something on the list or review something on the list of things that I'm good at. Yeah. Cause that would also help you recognize when people tell you things that you're good at. Sometimes those are, are harder to hear. Yeah. And not harder to hear, but we don't hear them as easily, maybe right. is what I'm right. saying. And so No, I'm right there with you. Streakers, this was a phenomenal conversation that we had with Marcus. I'm sure that you pulled away some of the things that you would like to set a streak around. Let us know what those are. You can email me, Jeffrey, J-E-F-F-E-R-Y at streakingmastery.com. Or Jamie, J-A-M-I at streakingmastery.com. Feel free to download the Streaking app and you can follow along as you see what we do, Jamie and I, intentionally through our streaks. That's at the Google Play Store or at Apple, at the Apple Ops app store and it's streaking s-t-r-e-a-k-i-n-g that's our app go ahead and download it and you can follow along with other people in the community who have streaks and see what their laughably simple streaks are and how they're becoming who they want to be well i enjoyed the conversation jamie it was absolutely fantastic um streakers have a wonderful phenomenal day and until we talk again keep streaking